When I was 13 years old and first learning how to play the bass guitar, I tried to learn Soil, a song off of System of a Down's debut record. Now there's this verse riff on the song that just it was incredibly frustrating to me at the time because I could not get the timing down no matter how hard I tried. This is what it sounds like. Knowing what I now know, I would say that this riff is based on alternating measures of 7, 8, and 4, 4. It's kind of like two measures of 4, 4, but the first measure is missing an eighth note, giving it this kind of aggressive record skipping effect that is just so irresistible. I'm a retail fraud and friendship, a weakness with the strength of youth. For reasons and the fine, reasons and the fine. Now what was so frustrating, but also so alluring about this riff is that I didn't understand it, couldn't wrap my brain around it, but I knew how to rock out to it. I knew how to move my body to it. And so does everybody in this crowd. They aren't counting alternating measures of 7, 8, and 4, 4. They're just going for it. This is a feeling that I have found very tantalizing over the years. The feeling of having your brain break in confusion with something that your body just feels to be inevitable. So for the past year and a half, drummer Sean Crowder and I have been working on music that explores the human perception of time through irregular grooves. And because they're grooves, you're meant to feel them, you're meant to embody them, you're meant to move to them. And with anything groove related, if you overthink them, even irregular grooves, you're kind of missing the point. You're missing the feelings that they might give you. So pull up a chair, grab a coffee or two, Today we are talking about the musical techniques of Perihelion, a record that we just released that explores the uncanny valley in musical perception, trying to get back to that feeling that I first felt learning the riff of Soil by System of a Down. Part one, metric modulation. Metric modulation is like a key change, except instead of changing keys, we change musical tempos based on some kind of rhythmic relationship. Double time swing. Double time is a basic metric modulation, where the quarter note of an old tempo becomes the half note of a new tempo, effectively doubling the speed. The new tempo has a two to one relationship to the previous tempo. The opposite is true too. You can have the tempo giving you half time, but you can do other relationships between tempos as well. Something that the American composer Charles Ives loved to exploit to tell musical stories, like in Putnam's Camp. In this piece for orchestra, you hear this mysterious music, which is interrupted by the sound of what sounds like soldiers marching nearby in a different tempo entirely. This has a rhythmic relationship of four to three. The whole note of the original tempo equals the dotted half note of the interrupting tempo. It's a pretty chaotic effect, but Charles Ives is using polytempo as well as polytonality to achieve an effect that we've all kind of experienced before. The feeling of standing in the middle between two separate musical events, like say, bachata is playing outside and you're in your one bedroom Bronx apartment making dinner and you're listening to a Maj Jamal on your sound system, which is of course, Something that's definitely happened to me before. Ives tells musical stories, like the one that I just told you, using complicated rhythms. Machina, the second track off of our album Perihelion, tells the musical story of La Machina, a car shifting gears from one tempo to another. The way that we get into this metric modulation is actually by playing both tempos at the same time for a period. There's this ostinato, which I'm playing over here on the stack with the left side of my body. Kind of sounds like a car engine. So I can keep this loop going and then play a beat with this side. This groove is built around a very slinky bass line that we stole from Jaco Pastorius, who played it on the outro of the Weather Report tune, River People.
Thank God you can't copyright baselines because we straight up stole it. Sorry, Jocko. Love you. And so what happens in that transition, for a brief moment, I actually play two tempos at once. At some point, the car downshifts to a slower tempo, but we keep the engine going on the left side and just shift the backbeat around. I play the dotted eighth note. So I'm accenting every third 16th note. It sounds like this. And then that speeds up slightly, and I hit every fifth 16th note. And so that becomes our new tempo. It's magic. So we get a story being told through metric modulation, a strange discombobulating feeling that comes from overlapping tempos, much in the same way that Charles Ives did. And then to get back, instead of hitting every fifth, uh, 16th note, we hit every fourth quintuplet. It's this weird thing where it's, it's really like a crossfade. It happens gradually and you almost don't even know what's happening until you're there in the new tempo. You're like, wow, how did I get here? very cool smooth way to transition between tempos that's it's a lot smoother than if you would just go abruptly from one tempo to the next speaking of discombobulating let's talk about part two the five three morphing trick The Dark is an orchestral pop song sung by Hannah Sumner that features an arpeggiated synthesizer in quintuplets, five notes per beat. The vocal melody, on the other hand, is in triplets, three notes per beat, the triplet flow that all the kids are listening to these days. When Han and I sat down to write the melody to Sean's scratch drum tracks, which were in quintuplets, we kept defaulting to triplet melodies. Which is very interesting, and I think there's a reason why that might be. Both quintuplets and triplets are uneven subdivisions. You can't divide a beat evenly with them, and so there's this inherent lopsided feeling to both kinds of rhythmic patterns. Like, you know, consider the quintuplet swing groove where you have an accented group of three quintuplets followed by an accented group of two, giving you this nice swing feeling. If you squint your eyes at this groove long enough, or I guess like squint your ears, you can kind of hear it as a triplet swing, just maybe like not played super precisely. And so like triplet and quintuplet grooves can like blur together. Sean wrote an arrangement of the Itsy Bitsy Spider in quintuplets for our Tuplets for Toddlers project, a children's album full of advanced rhythms. And the bass line that he wrote for me to play involved a lot of syncopated triplets, even though his drum part was all in quintuplets. Playing it didn't really feel like an exercise in polyrhythms. I actually didn't have to think about it too much. It felt very natural to combine triplets and quintuplets. The jingle that I use for all my Q&A videos is based on this triplet quintuplet thing. Like the backing track is in a quintuplet swing, but the vocal melody is just hitting all these triplets. This is what's kind of happening on the dark, but Sean's using this very clever trick using nested tuplets to take this whole thing a step further. If you take this quintuplet swing groove, you have this uh, space of three notes and two notes. If you take that first part of the beat, the three notes, and you evenly space two notes in between that, you get this. That just sounds like triplets. Is that just a triplet? 
I mean, it could be whatever you decide. And so in this song, that uh, little in-between note comes on the snare, so... question becomes, is it a wonky triplet or is it this nested quintuplet thing? And the answer is kind of both. When I wrote the string arrangement for the Wonderful Resonance Collective, they initially were a little freaked out by how the sheet music looked, but I just told them, hey, just think of it as triplets and you'll feel it just fine. And they nailed it on the first take. You know, musicians will joke all the time when confronted with crazy rhythms like this by saying, just feel it, man. But there's a degree of truth there because over time, musicians develop intuitions about their instruments and their bodies, and they can draw upon the tropes and the vocabulary of the music that uses these kinds of rhythms. And at a certain point, hopefully, you just feel it. Well, and what I like about these kind of rhythms that are really in between the grid, so to speak, is that they start to feel less mechanical and mathematical. They start feeling just like, I don't know, like it's a feeling. I don't even know what you call it, you know, so. Some of the most organic, non-mathematical rhythm I've ever heard comes through something I've heard called language melody, but you probably would recognize it as that style of playing along to memes that Charles Cornell and Mano Nien have popularized, where people are matching the vocal inflection of memes on their instruments, thus turning it into a kind of melody. And the way that you learn to do this is you basically listen to the same recording over and over and over again until you have the sound memorized. A very interesting kind of rhythm can happen when you overlay a sample on top of a groove and then try and do that language melody thing to the sample and kind of ignore what the groove is and do something that's off the grid a little bit. And the two things interacting can create this really interesting push and pull effect that we kind of exploited in Sungazer's All These People. The tune is constructed around a clave, a key rhythm on top of which all the other elements are built. This clave rhythm is built from two groupings of three sixteenth notes, one grouping of two sixteenth notes, and then four groupings of three sixteenth notes. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. You can divide this measure of 5-4 into two chunks, the first two beats and the last three beats. There are four evenly spaced notes, four dotted eighth notes in the last three beats, effectively giving you a four against three polyrhythm. These two notations are for the exact same music, they just look a little bit different. You can hear how this groove works in the solo section, featuring the wonderful guitar stylings of Tom Manda from Thank You Scientist. <laughs> It gets weird when we try and play a vocal sample that was laid on top of this rhythm. The way that this vocal sample sits, it lays on the measure so that it covers the space of nine sixteenth notes. But there are four syllables being pronounced and they're evenly spaced over that. So that would give us a four against nine polyrhythm, which is effectively a four against three within four against three. It honestly sounds like I'm playing off beats, but I'm a little sloppy. Like I'm a little out of time. <laughs> it's a pretty cool sound in context. You can say that it is a nested tuplet, but you could also just say play sloppy off beats and the effect is more or less the same. And then the second time that happens, there's another fill, which is still in this space of nine sixteenth notes, but I play this thing but that's nested within the 9 16th, so it's like. I mean, yeah, you could, you could double or triple nested it if you wanted to really get out there with the notation, because what is this thing on its own? That might be honestly very similar to the dark quintuplet triplet thing. 
it's it's like the reverse of that. Instead of three plus two with the nesting in the three, it'd be like two plus three with the nesting in the three. I mean, this all comes back to a feel thing at the end of the day. The analysis comes afterwards. This was, uh, you know, one of many fill ideas that we just tried and tested, you know, through experimenting. And this one just happened to sound and feel good. Now, I haven't described this rhythm yet. So far, I've just shown a slide that says insert spicy rhythm here. But if you had to define it, it'd be one layer of four against three, followed by a nested layer of four against three, which outlines the four syllables of you see all these, followed by two sets of quintuplets, themselves including a nested tuplet on the second half of three quintuplets. You could do that, but honestly, at the end of the day, we're just trying to figure out a way of playing along to a vocal sample with that language melody approach where you're just trying to match the sound of the recording and you're not worrying so much about the underlying groove. You're just trying to feel it. That connection, that's, that's key, because if you don't feel it, then other people don't feel it. And I think that's another thing that we try to do, whether it's conscious or not. So to go a little bit meta here, Sungazer is an independent band, and we don't have any record label support for this release of Perihelion. We don't have any PR firms that are pushing this record and trying to get publications to write reviews about it. Instead, the way that we're marketing this record is through social media, word of mouth, and through algorithmic engagement on YouTube. Both Sean and I have music theory YouTube channels that explore musical curiosities around the world, and so we've chosen to highlight musical curiosities in our own music in order to better promote it. The danger, of course, in this is that we might over-highlight certain elements in the music, like, for example, this. This ridiculous thing. This happens like for a split second in one song. But weirdly, it's a marketing tool. It serves the same function as PR firms sending out emails. Because we know what kind of content gets the clicks, which is that sweet music theory content, we're gonna promote it a certain way versus others. But we just don't wanna give anybody the wrong impression that this is the only thing that we care about. <laughs> so the, the 13 tuplet reggaeton. But yeah, don't worry. There's a lot more to talk about on this record if that's your thing. Go check it out. If there's anything off the record that you want explored further, let us know, because there there's a lot of brain-breaking rhythm on there. If you enjoy my channel or anything that I do here, please go check out my Patreon. There's a Patreon Discord that you can go to and talk about music theory with other like-minded individuals. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Perry Helion is out now. Woo! You can definitely get into this morphing zone between the rhythms where you can go from a quintuplet swing to a triplet-ish thing. There's like shades of triplet in between all of them. That's really cool. Peace.